Good morning, everybody. Today's Saturday, um, the 13th of February. We are delighted to have some guests um, from consultants and developer to discuss the what we call the DPW site, which is an initiative the village has taken on to look at mixed um, affordable housing units in what is currently being used um, by the village. It sits near the waterfront, which is important to this conversation as the topic of this session, and we've had a number of them, the topic of this session is focused on uh, public engagement regarding environmental issues. Um, clearly, um, if you're joining us today and you have other questions, please do feel free to ask. We've just tried to create um, a series of sessions that deal with different topics so that we can actually uh, delve deeper into the public's questions. We have also, since uh, we've last met, uh, for those of you that are following us, have also added a FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, so that you can go on those and see some of uh, the previous sessions questions um, curated in a way that bundles a whole bunch of questions that are most um, asked. We are going to have, I think, um, Assistant Village Manager Maddie, I believe today, um, if you have a question once the presentation is complete, if you have questions, raise your hand um, and we will bring you in so that if you want to be seeing you, you take your video off. If you don't want to, that's fine. We do ask that since this is a Village of Austin project, that you let us know um, what your relationship is to the village, whether you live here or work here, have a business here, um, or just have an interest. So we do appreciate that. And I'm just trying to see who's on that I need to specifically talk about. There was an addition last night. The, I do not know if all of the board members had a chance to see um, the presentation. It was delivered to us uh, for no, no special reason. It was just that um, uh, it was delivered last night. I got to look at it very briefly this morning. Um, so we may or may not be able to um, answer some of your questions. And uh, immediately, and I see that we have most of the board here, uh, four out of the five board members are with us today. I think we can get started with the presentation. I believe I'm turning it over to village manager, Karen Diatori. Good morning, Karen. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. I see we're, we're um, getting more attendees uh, as, as this meeting is starting. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we are now going to provide a brief presentation that really details um, the uh, preservation of green space or, or increased access to green space at the site as well as the green and sustainable components of the project itself and with that I'd like to turn it over to our director of planning Jaime Martinez who will be joined by members of the Wilder Walter team to talk about um, the uh, aspects of the building and then we will engage um, and entertain any questions or comments you may have. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so just to, you know, first, good morning all to, to the public that's here and good morning to all my colleagues that are here for this presentation. I think this is our um, fourth presentation at this point. So covering a lot of new details every single time. And so excited to bring this, um, this new level, which is going to talk about, uh, as the village manager mentioned, uh, the, the green aspects of this project, the greening of the, the, the greenway itself, the building itself, but also some of the resiliency from uh, climate change and, and sea level rise. So I'm going to get right into that. And I'm going to share my screen. And so just let me know if there's any issues with lag or if there's any issues with the uh, screen so that can make sure everybody can see it. All right. So first, you know, we try to start off all these presentations with a little bit of a recap. Uh, we do know that, you know, there's a lot of the same people that are coming to these meetings, but there are new people coming every time. So we want to make sure that we at least give you an opportunity to hear the, the top line notes about the project. So, you know, a little bit about the site itself, the 3.4 acre site bounded by Water Street, Main Street, Seeker Road, and Central Avenue. And the site is traversed by the Sing Sing Kill. Uh, it is a contaminated brownfield site because uh, it was used from uh, the 1850s all the way up into the 1940s as a coal gas plant uh, by multiple entities, the final entity being uh, Con Ed 
um, who owned it at the very end. Uh, and it is subject to a consent order uh, by the New York State Department of Environmental Con Con Conservation uh, with Con Edison. Uh, so this is a look at what it actually looked at, looked like many, many years ago. Um, I think Trusty White can say the exact year of this uh, photo, but I want to say it was the early 1900s. Uh, you mute, you're muted. 1930. Yeah, okay. Uh, so you can see kind of the, gold, uh, the coal uh, gas plants and, and the heavy, heavy industrial nature of the site. Uh, there. The whole waterfront was heavily industrial. Yeah. Uh, this is what the site looks like now. There's um, some of those sheds on the southern end of the site are actually gone, but the DPW buildings on the north side of the kill are still there. Uh, and the rest of it pretty much remains the same. Kind of a, um, a site that was formerly heavily, you know, occupied and has very little left. Uh, so the proposed use is a uh, mixed-use building which would have 109 residential units with a range of affordability from 30 percent to 80 percent AMI. Uh, the extension of the Sing Sing Kill Greenway uh, through the site onto Water Street is one of the major components of this project and we're going to talk about that today. Uh, and there's also a parking garage for residents uh, with potential for a, an additional level of municipal parking to be built by the developer. Uh, and this is kind of the close-up look of what it uh, what it looks like. So, so you know, when, when we talk about the site, one of the big concerns that's come up is is this site really um, able to be built on? We have you know issues of sea level rise. We have issues of uh, climate change, and there has been a lot of concern expressed about whether we should be building on this site uh, or other sites in the waterfront. And so, you know, it was important for us to really go through and and figure out. Um, you know, what was going on with the site uh, as a part of this RFP process and make sure that the developer understood um, the future impact of, of climate change. So uh, this site is located in the lower lying area of the village. And many of you, I'm sure, would remember that during Superstorm Sandy, uh, part of the site was inundated with water uh, in the area near the bridge. Uh, also in 2019, uh, 2019, Cornell prepared a climate adaptive design studio and it brought many of these concerns to the fore for the community, talking about how we could uh, develop um, in, in a climate adaptive way along the waterfront. Uh, so when preparing the proposal, uh, the building engineers started with baseline of the um, proposed FEMA flood map. So there, there are approved FEMA flood, flood maps. They're a little old. Uh, they, so they started with the proposed ones, which are um, considered of more climate change uh, uh, on top of that, they layered a 30-inch sea level rise uh, and further considered a 100-year storm under that 30-inch sea level rise condition. Uh, and that's sort of the baseline where they started at and trying to figure out uh, how the building would be built out. Uh, some of the components of this, the environmentally sustainable components of this project are that it is being designed to meet LEED gold standards of sustainable construction design uh, to ensure environmental sustainability is essential to the development. Um, and it's also gonna incorporate electro, um, electric vehicle charging stations in, in the public garage, as well as an electrical vehicle uh, car sharing program for the, um, the residents of the building. And so a little bit about that, that climate adaptive design. This is the lookbook. So if any of you have gotten a chance to look at it, this is um, showing some of the designs. Um, and for the, uh, you know, the sea level rise, one of the big things that people in the community have, have expressed to us is, you know, talking about those Cornell numbers that were used by that lookbook. Uh, these are those numbers that you get uh, from Columbia that fed into the Cornell adaptive design. Um, you can actually go to the website, build out, you know, a 30 inch sea level rise like I did here, a hundred year storm uh, like I did here. You can run the numbers, see it visualized here. Um, and for the purposes of like the engineer, you can download the data and integrate that data into, um, you know, your architectural drawings or your GIS maps. Uh, you wanted to. Uh, that's here at the Hudson River Flood Impact Decision Support System, um, and you can you can find it online. You just Google it. It's it's very very interesting. Can I, can I just ask a question? I didn't I didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. I may. What is that blue dotted line? I'm sorry. I'm just not seeing it clearly. What does that mean? Blue dotted line. So the blue dotted line is where the system thinks the water's edges. And so that's, you know, a rendered 
thing from the data that they have. Obviously, the aerial photography will show it a little different. Um, there's LIDAR data. And so there's tons of different data sets that feed into this. So when you see that line, it's not exact. Um, it's not exact because more than likely it was drawn from a map that looked at a huge, you know, very drawn out area that didn't zoom right into the, um, to the community. Uh, it's pretty good, but not perfect. And that's why these systems are made as guides to help, um, you know, review things, right? So I, I, I guess you could take it to consider Westchester County has two foot contours and they're pretty good in general. Uh, when you're looking at large areas, but when you wanted to go and, you know, develop a small little parcel for a house, you still have to do a survey of that site uh, to figure out exactly where those contours are, because the generalized two-foot contours are for all of Westchester County, um, and they're not specific to every single square foot. That's what this is here. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the greenway designs, uh, where, so this is actually the part of the section where we're going to hear from the, uh, the designers of this. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, a little context to this, the original construction of the Sing Sing Kill Greenway, um, when it was built, always anticipated that they would eventually, you know, try to build it under that arch and through the BPW site and onto Water Street. Uh, it wasn't something that could be done at that time, but it was always considered a part of it. Uh, and because of that, it was it was made a key component of the RFQ, uh, and now it's a central component of the proposed development by this developer. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Maxwell Powell of, you know, I, I don't want to say the name because I just always forget it. Fire Blender Bell. Can you hear me? Fire Blender Bell. Yes. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Henry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Maxwell Powell. I'm an, I'm an architect and urban designer. Uh, and a partner at Bayer Blinda Bell in New York City. Uh, we're a 53-year-old firm, and um, you, some of you might know us from our work on sort of many, many building typologies, such as landmarks uh, like Grand Central Terminal. But we also do a lot of mixed-use ground-up developments of various scales uh, across the region. Um, we are the master planners and the architects for this site, uh, and our underlying approach uh, to all of our projects is that the architecture and planning needs to be contemporary and site-specific. Right, so we find opportunities within each site uh, and building program uh, to design architecture that's authentic to a place uh, and to build upon its real and potential strengths. Uh, so for us here in Austin, um, you know, we were immediately attracted to the potential of the site and the physical challenges uh, that it poses. So I thought uh, what might be useful, and, and I know most of you probably know the site very well, I thought it might be useful to just um, we um, take a look at the drone video and uh, share some of the our initial observations as well. So Jaime, if you wouldn't mind starting the drone video. Great, thank you. So, you know, what attracted us uh, initially to the site um, when we first heard about it was the, obviously the unique qualities of the site being adjacent to mass transit, you know, as a short walk from the train station. And then, you know, when we got to the site, we, we walked through the site, we quickly realized that, you know, the, the physical imposition of the site and this challenging uh, type, uh, uh, topology is gonna be really interesting uh, for this site. You know, this of course included the Sing Sing Kill, you know, which runs right through the middle of the site, sort of splitting the site into two halves, um, you know, to the sort of incredibly, industrial character um, of, and history of the western half of the site with the DPW uh, buildings. Um, and, and then of course, as you sort of make your way eastward in the site, this sort of incredible natural preserve, right? You know, this sort of stark contrast um, that was very interesting to us of, of, of this sort of uh, contrast between the sort of natural preserve and sort of the developed DPW uh, portion of the site. Um, you know, and then as we walk through the site, you know, we also were fortunate to experience this sort of gem of this linear open space is of course your river walk um, that just ended north and across the street from this site. Um, and of course the village's intent to extend it through the site. So, you know, all of these elements, I think for us, which existed, you know, both on and sort of directly around our site, um, despite the irregularity and physical constraints of the site, you know, we really felt that this site holds the key to unlocking an important connection and placemaking opportunity, you know, right in the heart of the village, right? So that was sort of important for us, when, the takeaway for us when we uh, visited the site and we went back to our office and we kind of thought about what, how we would um, plan uh, and master plan the site. Right. 
Okay, so, um, so let's start with this uh, first image here, which is sort of just the context plan. Um, you know, so from a site planning uh, perspective, uh, for us really, you know, we felt that this site was uh, the gateway into the village and uh, between the, the waterfront and, and the village and vice versa. Uh, and from an open space perspective, you know, we agreed that it was important to turn this you know, existing very sort of closed off site into something much more porous and much more open to the public. Um, and that the site could be purposeful as an extension of the village where people would be uh, able to come in, they'd be welcomed and experience uh, the, the canal way, the waterway, the kill um, as on the Western end, as well as experience the natural, you know, forested area to the East. Um, and, and that rather than being mutually exclusive in terms of the development in the open space, but that they actually reinforce each other and kind of built off of each other. So we thought that was really, really important and, and real opportunity here. Um, you know, also, the, you know, the context drove how we thought about the site as well, um, how we masked the buildings, how the building design relates to the open space, the topography, the streets, um, and fostering movement through the site. Um, you know, in fact, we saw the Greenway extension through the site and the kill coming through the site really as a huge, huge advantage to the development because it allowed the buildings to have a frontage and a public base on the kill. And I'll show you what, what I mean by that in a, in a few slides. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, Amy. Yeah, so these are just some photos. You know, of course, these were taken not in the winter. So, you know, when we got there, um, it's very different, obviously, in the winter and, and when there's foliage on the trees. Uh, and you can really kind of see sort of the, this, this amazing contrast and this amazing sort of, um, sort of pre natural preserve on the eastern end of the site. Uh, so the top left photo is just, you know, uh, an image that's closer to Water Street uh, with the kill and sort of the um, deteriorating uh, walls along the kill. The top right photo is sort of the more natural condition of the kill coming through the site. Uh, the bottom left photo is a view looking east towards Central Avenue and the archway and how the, how the kill comes through it. And of course, the bottom right is the greenway on the other side of the street. So there's a little bit of orientation there. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a, a, the first floor plan, um, which I think I can use to kind of explain the overall master planning concept. Um, you know, so the approach was to make the sinks and kill, the topography and the natural landscape, a central feature of the project and to flank the um, either side of the kill with two buildings that rise up and uh, with the surrounding topography. So if we start with the building that's along Central Avenue. That is the uh, proposed garage um, that sort of rises up along with the topography of, of uh, Central Avenue. So the, so the building, you know, is sort of takes its place uh, replacing the existing DPW garage building um, and, and that sort of rises up along with uh, Central Avenue. Uh, next to the garage, You'll notice uh, there's a proposed new fire lane that currently does not exist. The fire lane, of course, will serve the future um, access to both of the buildings. Uh, but it's also, uh, in our minds, in, uh, in all the other t uh, time of the day, you know, a, a pedestrian amenity, right? It's, it's, it's uh, uh, an opportunity for people to experience the sinks and kill on both sides of it uh, for us. Um, and then across the sinks and kill is the second building, which, of course, is the main uh, mixed-use building of the project. Um, and what we wanted to do here was to encourage a real active building presence along the entire canal frontage for the building. So we wanted to activate the canal, bring people into the site, uh, and using uh, that frontage as, as sort of a way to do that, right? So you'll see that we deliberately placed active uses along the frontage. So we start with retail that turns the corner for Water Street, uh, turns the corner onto the Sing Sing Hill. Right, could, which could be you know, sort of very open and very welcoming um, and sort of a public face to the project. Uh, we then placed uh, the lobby and some of the residential amenities sort of in the middle of the building block facing the kill, which again will provide sort of 24 seven uh, activity and eyes onto the, onto the kill as well. And then uh, the last piece, which I think is actually a very important piece is the community space that we placed on the Eastern end of the building. And, the decision to place it on the eastern uh, end of the building was a very deliberate move. We really felt it was important to bring a public use as far and as deep into the site as possible, right? Sort of at the transition zone between sort of the western part of the site and the eastern sort of natural part of the site. And it sort of, for us, felt like we were able to bring a more public use in the destination uh, deeper into the site. Um, with respect to the building on the south, the, the main, or the, the building, uh, the mixed-use building, 
Um, we raised the entire building up above the preliminary FEMA 100-year floodplain levels. Um, and if, it's a little bit hard to tell, but each of the spaces that fronts the kill has a different elevation and it steps up as the kill moves towards the east, as the kill sort of steps up as well. Um, so as a result, the walkway that's sort of directly in front of our building, between the kill and our building, which I'm sort of calling the promenade, will also be regraded, right? So they will have a gentle slope that kind of slopes towards the east, meeting ADA so that it's an accessible site, but also provide access and uh, barrier-free access into each of these uh, components of the building. Um, you know, the kill walls as a result will also be uh, re-engineered and rebuilt, which I think is an important part of, of this process as well. Um, and all of these improvements, of course, will be engineered uh, to not impact the existing capacity of the Sing Sing Kill or the floodplain. Um, and in fact, there is a, a stormwater retrofit uh, project that's planned just south of the archway, uh, just south of Central Avenue, um, which would sort of expand um, the, the water reservoir there to improve water quality and help dissipate flows uh, from the upstream coming into our site. So that's part of the stormwater uh, management uh, on this entire site. Um, and then finally, you'll notice there is a new bridge connection that's between the garage and the community space that we are uh, proposing that we just cross uh, the kill, which serves two purposes. The first is it provides a turnaround for the fire trucks. If they come in, they have to be able to come back out. But actually what it does is provides a pedestrian connection uh, between the garage and the community space and also provides an ability to, for you to actually loop around uh, the Sing Sing kill, which we thought was really really fun. Um, the next slide, uh, I believe, is the roof plan. Right. So uh, in terms of the overall site plan, uh, again, all of the development is largely located at the western end where the DPW uses currently are. Uh, and we're staying away from the steep slope areas, which helps us preserve uh, not only the natural landscape on the east, but also uh, the natural landscape around us, particularly along uh, Main Street as the, as the street rises up towards the village. Um, and then just keeping as much open space as possible to maintain the, you know, the naturally picturesque quality uh, of the site while improving the hardscape on the western half of the kill. Um, you know, it, it, as we noticed on, on sort of the early uh, uh, views, you know, the building also steps up uh, from Water Street. And on each of these steps, uh, we are considering uh, placing uh, portions of that uh, as uh, green roofs. And on the very top of the roof, um, we're planning to have a, a photovoltaic array on the very top of the roof, which will get you know, really good sunlight and I think would, would, would be very, very um, effective. Uh, so I think what we'll do now is um, we prepared a series of sort of still uh, uh, images uh, as though, uh, sort of as a sequence, as though you're walking from Central Avenue and Water Street up towards the uh, Greenway extension. I thought maybe that's a sort of a good way to sort of three-dimensionally see you know, what this could feel like. Um, these of course are gonna be you know, very early conceptual sketches, um, but it hopefully does give, give you a sense of space and what we're thinking about in terms of materiality and scale and the feel um, in terms of what we're thinking about in terms of the uh, uh, initial design vision. So why don't we start with the, with the first view. On the next slide, yep. So, uh, we'll, so we'll pair these with an, a before and an after, and I think it's useful because it helps us sort of orient where we're standing. Uh, so this is, you know, the view from Central Avenue and Water Street across the site. You know, the building on the left is the existing DPW garage site. Um, the kill is just behind the middle fence there on, on the, towards the right of the image. And then sort of the, the background is Main Street kind of quickly climbing up, um, up towards the village. Um, and this view we updated uh, on the next slide. Um, the sort of proposed view of what that might look like from this vantage point, right? So again, um, you know, uh, as we had uh, previously uh, discussed, you know, we, we feel, you know, the architecture should be simple, uh, but using materials that are found throughout the village, right? Whether it's masonry or brick or metal, or even some wood uh, being utilized uh, in a way that provides a bit of a robustness to the building design um, uh, relating to sort of the industrial history of the site and heritage of the site. Um, I also mentioned uh, previously about the setbacks on the roof, so you can kind of see that here on, on the main mixed-use building where we start to set back the building massing from Water Street and it climbs up as the building moves uh, towards the east. Uh, again, uh, one or both of those roofs may have a green roof components and the top of the roof will have a, a photovoltaics. Um, Jaime mentioned that this building will be 
designed as a lead gold building. So there are a number of critical sustainable elements that we will be planning for, uh, including the solar generation, but also a very, very tight building envelope. This is of course not a all glass building. This is a building that's got punch windows and solids, you know, which would allow us to really enhance the uh, thermal performance of the building, um, along with other uh, sustainable features like low flow fixtures and energy smart appliances and all of that stuff, uh, which uh, you know, we, 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 we put in all of our buildings now, uh, and especially so in, in lead gold buildings. Uh, so the next slide uh, is the view if we were to cross the street uh, sort of right as you enter the site now, right? So uh, right behind that fence there, you can see the Sing Sing Kill uh, and, the, and, the, and the wall. Uh, on the left is the DPW garage. And on the right, where it says no trespassing, that's sort of where the, the new building uh, is proposed on the right side. And if you go to the next slide, you get a sense of what this space can also feel like, what this open space can feel like. There we go. So, you know, what we're seeing here um, is sort of the pro proposed view, right? So you see this, the Sing Sing Kill coming through. Uh, what we've done here is we've regraded, as I mentioned before, the promenade along the, um, the path of the Sing Sing Kill so that it's raised up above the flood elevation. Uh, so it's a nice sort of gentle slope that slopes up as you move towards the east. Um, the garage to the left with the fire lane, which is also a pedestrian path, uh, pedestrian promenade on that side of the kill. And then on the right side, uh, the new building. Um, and what you see directly on the right is that retail space. We've taken the retail space and we've pushed it back a few feet so that we've kind of widened the aperture as you enter the site, uh, which we felt was really a nice way of creating a more inviting and engaging entryway coming into, uh, into the site, frankly. Uh, so that uh, you also notice um, the rebuilt uh, walls along the canal way. And what we did here was we thought it was important if we're gonna be rebuilding it, let's raise it a few inches. Let's bring it up to about 18 inches above the ground plane so that you can also create seating, right? So that it's not just a place where people are walking by, but it's a place where people can take a stop, you know, grab a uh, coffee and have a seat and have conversations. So it really, I think, becomes sort of a, a nice sort of community space um, uh, that has a nice mixture of, of, of hardscape and softscape. And then if we move further up, so let's imagine us kind of walking a little bit further up, sort of midway along the block. This is sort of the view of, of, of where that location is. On the left right there, you can see the wall of the Sing Sing Kill just to the left of us. And then on the right is uh, sort of the, the DP, DPW yard. And the next slide shows what that could feel like, sort of further up along the canal. Uh, so this is really sort of right by the, um, the entrance to the residential building on the right here uh, with the doors. Uh, on the left, of course, is the canal way. Uh, you'll notice the bridge, the new bridge that connects uh, the two sides of the uh, Sing Sing Kill, the garage on the, on the left, and just on the right, uh, sort of um, on, on the other side of the bridge, but on the right, that little glass box there, that's a community space, right? So again, you know, it was important for us, we thought it was important to place the community space further in on the site. So we create sort of a beacon and a destination uh, for the public um, to, to go there. And then even just beyond that, you can capture a glimpse of the extension to the Greenway, which is sort of that little um, ramp-like uh, piece uh, further just in, in the background of the image. And then the next slide, so now imagine us sort of walking now beyond the buildings and into the natural preserve. And again, there's no intention to really modify anything in this, in this area other than to create an accessible path. Uh, so this here is an existing view looking back towards uh, Central Avenue. You can see the archway supporting Central Avenue. Uh, and then the next view uh, shows sort of an overlay of, of how that uh, can transform, right? With the greenway coming through uh, the archway and landing itself on the eastern side of the Sing Sing Kill um, onto a pathway which would then connect back to the promenade that we were just walking on uh, previously. So, um, you know, I think this is uh, really, really exciting for us. You know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I think, you know, the Greenway extension, the kill and the proposed building configurations, um, you know, really form the spine that ties together the entire master plan and, and helps reconnect the village and its waterfront um, at a pedestrian level. So thank you very much for your time uh, and the opportunity for us to share these uh, initial uh, design concepts with you.
Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, Jaime, is there, um, is this go back now to the presentation or is that the it end does, of the yeah, presentation? There are just a few more uh, slides Great. to kind of recap. Great. And, um, Thank you. Uh, so just a real quick recap for the general public of the project timeline. Uh, the approval uh, does require multiple steps. So first step, which has already been completed, it was the selection of a preferred developer. Uh, at that point, uh, it, you go into the development of the land acquisition and disposition agreement um, and getting that sort of set forth. And that's essentially what's going to be built there, uh, what the price will be and so on and so forth, as well as the, com the community engagement process. Both of those items are currently ongoing. This, this meeting is one of the uh, elements of that community engagement process. Um, after that process is completed, uh, it would move forward to potentially the approval of the LADA. Uh, if the LADA was approved, it would then move on to the State Environmental Quality Review Act, uh, Environmental Review. Uh, it would be um, referred out to the uh, Village's Environmental Advisory Council. It would be uh, referred out to the uh, Planning Board for Site Plan Approval. Uh, and it would also require another special permit uh, approval from the Board of Trustees, uh, as well as, you know, once all of that is completed and done, if, if it does get to that point, uh, the implementation of the LADA, and the, the transfer of the property and the development uh, of the project. Um, so the next steps in the engagement process um, are, you know, for the general public, if this is your first time going to the meeting, you want to hear about the previous meetings, you can go to uh, Austin DPW site Com, and you can see videos of all the previous um, presentations that were made. Uh, and we, you know, don't want you just to come to this one and go to the last ones, but also come check out the future ones where we talk about the different uh, elements. You can find the schedule for all of the future DPW engagement meetings at the villageofostening.org uh, forward slash Austin uh, hyphen DPW hyphen site. Uh, or you can just go to the community calendar and you can see it there. Um, and so the, uh, the very next meeting is going to be on February 25th at 7 p.m. Uh, it says it's called Dark Matter. It's going to be more focused on the brownfield um, component of this project and uh, what it's doing to work on that and, and get, kind of dig more into those details. Um, and, uh, you know, with that, uh, we're going to open it up for questions, but we do want to hear more from you uh, today and tomorrow and, and every day soon. Uh, so please do attend those future meetings. And if you have any um, questions that you want to email directly uh, to the Board of Trustees and Administration, you can email at plan at villageofostening.org. Uh, with that, I will hand it back over to the Village Manager. Thank you, Jaime. Thank you, Maxwell. That was a, a very informative presentation. So I noticed that we have um, three hands up. Um, I'm not sure what order, uh, but I see Roslyn, uh, Miguel Hernandez, and Susie Ross. So Maddie, um, can you start by bringing over, um, that's the order I have them in. So uh, if you could yep. start by bringing Roslyn in. Sure, sure thing. Oh, Roslyn has now taken down her hand. Um, so I'm not sure if that was a mistake, um, but Roslyn, please feel free to raise your hand again if indeed you do have a question. Um, I am going to bring over Miguel Hernandez. Uh, Mr. Hernandez, when you come in, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself and give us uh, your relationship to Austin, please. Uh, good morning. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you for a very good presentation very clear, very concise. Um, I, I, um, I live about, um, I would say, uh, a half a mile from this site. And uh, I travel down the street, you know, quite frequently uh, on my way in and out of the village. <clears throat> okay. Um, my questions are very brief. Uh, one, um, I am concerned about the the impact that this project might have on the stream. As you may know, this stream um, uh, is affected by the tides of the Hudson River, and it does, in fact, um, uh, flow in into the Hudson River. So uh, one of the things that I believe will, will need to be, happen is, in addition to all of the environmentals, 
is that um, it requires the intervention, uh, it possibly requires the intervention of the Army Corps of Engineers. So um, we, do, we, we have another project, I'm going to go into it, that where the stream is impacted and, it wa and the stream was not protected uh, properly during construction and so forth. But anyway, there will be, whether it's during construction or after construction, um, that, that stream does have to have a, uh, have to be taken into consideration. Um, and in regard to that, um, this, uh, I'm wondering uh, what, um, not geological, um, archeological studies have been made with regard to, to the history of this site. I believe that at one time, there before the, um, you know, back in the 19th century, uh, before the gas tanks were put in there, that uh, there was uh, one or more um, mills uh, which, which used the water of the stream to, to power themselves. So I'm concerned about the uh, archeological uh, study as well. Uh, one very minor thing is, uh, I don't know <laughs> if I particularly like the design of this building. It looks kind of rather plain to me, but you know, uh, that's that's strictly a matter of of taste. But uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there are, you know, other designs that might um, more more closely reflect the uh, the history of the village and of the site. Okay, that's not a big deal, but you know, it's just something that I'm concerned with. So with that. Um, I'll, I'll let go and, and see if you have some answers for me uh, now or later, as you please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Um, for your first question, I want to turn it over to our uh, village engineer, uh, Paul Fraioli, who I think can speak uh, uh, quite um, inform informatively about the um, uh, precautions and about the um, issues we're doing to protect the stream and enhance um, actually enhance what's currently there, so. Thank you, Karen. Good morning. I'd like to start by um, appreciating Maxwell's um, furtherance of what he presented when Wilder Boulder was a finalist in the RFP selection. It's nice to see what they talked about conceptually is really starting to take shape. A lot of the components in Mr. Powell's presentation were included as a requirement in the RFQ for the development, inclusive of the stormwater measures that were going to be implemented into the Kilbrook Trail. So that's very nice to see. We all appreciate that, and I think I think you really um, you spot on with what you are what you're delivering conceptually now, um, compared to what the village envisioned when they went out with an RFP for this project. So thank you for that. I, I, I enjoyed that presentation. That said, uh, Mr. Hernandez, your concern with the stormwater um, pre and post construction, I guess can best be answered by this. When we originally undertook the Kilbrook Trail project, um, a lot of that and, and stormwater quality, when we originally undertook that Kilbrook Trail project, um, as you know, the Kilbrook included a sanitary sewer line, which was compromised in the Kilbrook. The project was originally implemented to address the concerns with that sanitary line. And obviously it grew into the, the trail that it is today. The trail has a collateral benefit of bringing a lot of visual attention to the surrounding properties. I think by default that, that, um, that leads to what we did down there. It gets the property owners to treat their properties the same way and keeps a lot of the debris and formally um, thrown over the edge property garbage into the Kilbrook. So between the removal of the sanitary inflow and infiltration and the refuse that was continually thrown into the Kilbrook, the Kilbrook, um, environment is much improved. That mantra is going to
continue under Central Avenue Arch now onto this new property where um, its present use, although we're very considerate of the stream in its present use now, that wasn't always the case historically. And its use after this project is completed, I think will um, benefit the stream immensely um, with regard to what ends up making its way in there from the surrounding properties. Um, the stormwater measures, including the reconstruction of the sidewall, some improvements to the head wall, and most importantly, which he, he just kind of briefly mentioned it, but the, um, the upstream, I'll call it the energy dissipation pond or whatever we're, we're, uh, they ultimately design underneath the Central Avenue Bridge mm -hmm. is gonna do a tremendous amount of um, aid to the downhill culverts, downstream culverts that run underneath the Villages parking lot and the Metro North Railway. Um, that dissipation pond will ultimately be able to, by its design, remove a lot of the floatable debris. If there, There's not much left in there now after the Kilbrook Trail, but there's gonna be some that makes its way down the stream. And it also will serve to remove a lot of the sediment that gets picked up during high, um, high storm flows. And that will be something that ultimately will be monitored and maintained and, and do much to improve the downhill, uh, I did it again, the downstream um, impacts of stormwater flow. The, um, the construction of the building, that, which was mentioned by Jaime early in the presentation, included um, the use of the bullet that pointed out the use of the new, the new maps that are still yet to be adopted by FEMA, which actually brings the building um, out of the floodplain, um, either even further than what is presently required. Uh, on top of the fact that um, I'm glad Rich Williams is on the phone with us too today. Um, on top of the 100 year uh, floodplain calculation that they're using. So I think that, um, again, they addressed every request for stormwater and Kilbrook design that we asked for in RFP. Obviously, there's a lot of um, there's a lot more details that need to take this concept to a construction document, but I'll use that as a as a segue to ask if Mr. Williams from Insight Engineer, um, who's Wilder Boulder Civil Site Engineer, he wants to expand on any of that. Sure, thanks, Paul, and good morning, everyone. Um, Mr. Hernandez, as as we do move from concept through construction, our construction documents will ultimately address both temporary construction conditions as well as final build out. Um, we will also be coordinating with numerous agencies beyond the village of Austin to secure all necessary permits for that work. Um, and as you've correctly identified, Army Corps may be one of those agencies. And just to touch on the on-site stormwater, you know, currently there is no stormwater treatment and everything discharges into the Sing Sing Kill um, as part of our design plans, we will be improving stormwater quality. You heard Maxwell mention uh, green roofs, as well as some other stormwater improvements that we'll be uh, integrating into the stormwater pollution prevention plan. All these various improvements should help and will help improve water quality within the Sing Sing Kill. And, and I, I wanna just quickly add in here that a lot of these really site-specific um, questions that need to be handled uh, are handled at the planning board level. Uh, so that, you know, when site plan approval goes forward, there has to be much more uh, rich and developed, um, you know, schematic drawings that are given out that, that help get to that decision. And that's a public process where uh, people can come out and comment. Uh, so the, the plans that you're going to, you saw today don't really have the full level of detail on that. And that's, that's just because of where we are in the process. Um, in the process and, and therefore um, that will be coming down the road. Thank you. Um, if I can add something, please. Sure. Sorry. Um, it's a listening session, but I have to say, it. Miguel, I'm so happy to see you on this call. Um, it's been so long since I've seen you. I've got to say hi to you hi. Um, and Tam. And, and I'm not asking you to participate fully in this process. Um, I'm going to almost have to order you to be very involved in this. Your um, insight into um, the history of this village, um, 
I don't want to say it competes with Dana, that's not polite, but uh, with the two of you being involved, uh, your question about archaeology never even occurred to me. I haven't even heard that as part of the conversation. I think it's important, the history. Um, you live right up the road from there. Um, so I am imploring you to take the time and really look at these presentations and be highly involved. I think most of us uh, know you and we know how much you care about this community. And um, I'm expecting to really hear from you, negative and positive. It's all good because I think there is absolute 100% intention to have um, the best uh, product at the end of all this um, for this property. There's no question in my mind that that is the ultimate goal. So uh, looking forward to seeing you on more of the Zooms. I'd like to second that. And I'd also like to say Miguel's knowledge of local history far outpaces mine. <laughs> Thank you. Know, you. I, I do want to address, uh, 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 Mr. Hernandez, your, your um, comment about the architectural, I mean, I'm sorry, the archeological issues. So, so one of the issues that we know we have um, with, with the Sing Sing Hill over time is that you know, as, as the, the village has evolved and grown and so much of that history um, is really, has been really relegated to history. So opening up the site and being conscious of that uh, really gives us an opportunity to shine a light on that history. And I would like to defer to Trustee White to talk about some of the aspects of that since uh, she was our former uh, village historian. Um. Well, I have no doubt there were probably mills there that used the, you know, the rushing water of the of the kill to power their their water wheels. I can look back at old maps and and see if anything shows up. There's not much pre 1852. Um, there may be some renderings somewhere, but there were certainly mills upstream by the where the community center is now, and you can see old millstones in the in the water. Um, so my feeling is that, um, that there can be a lot of care taken that if anything is discovered that could be a remnant or evidence of that, that it's retained, left, or in some way preserved. Um, hard to say what may turn up. Um, archaeologically, archeolo you know, if you want to go back to ancient peoples, I have no doubt this was a that the indigenous peoples were settled along this area. Uh, unfortunately, uh, all um, remnants of them are confined to pieces of pottery, uh, things you may, now is it, is it out of the question that something like that comes up? No, it's not out of the question. Uh, so it's certainly something that, um, that um, I think can, we can be very sensitive to. I know I can. And we know Miguel, we know you are as well. So we agree on that, so. No, I, I'm just saying that maybe a study about that should be included in his plan. I, you know, it, it, it is costly, of course. I don't know, I don't know the cost, but you need somebody who is expert in that area. I'm not, you know, archeologically trained. I have other historical training, but archeology span is not one of them. But I think that's something that at least should be part of it so that we know what's there and you know maybe there is nothing there but perhaps some uh, if there are any remnants rem remnants then certainly they should be saved or or uh, memorialized in some way and if I could just take one more second I know you're quite busy and you need to get on and there are other people but um, I, I had made a suggestion a while back that we that the uh, the grinding wheels that are up further in the stream from the uh, file factory should be taken out of the water and put near the near the site with some kind of signage indicating you know what they are because the more they just stay in the water. Uh, the more floods will destroy them and, and they may be totally gone. So I believe that there are three or four uh, grinding wheels from the, um, from the old file factory up there and maybe something could be done about those. That's not, you know, for you to decide now, but I'm just saying that's the kind of thing that we need to 
look at. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Um, just to, to wrap this up, because there is actually a regulatory process that does um, take into consideration historic use of the properties um, that are being developed, um, what may have happened with indigenous cultures um, on these properties many years ago. So I would like to just have Bill Balter talk a little bit about what is known as the SHPO process. Okay. Hi. So as a part of this uh, process, especially relating to the funding from New York State, uh, they require us to get what's called SHPO clearance, which is a state historic preservation office. Um, so we'll hire a cultural resource consultant, as we've done in many developments, most recently in Tarrytown, where they basically study the history of the site that, such as Mr. Hernandez is talking about, and then they basically suggest what needs to be further studied, if anything, on this site, I assume there will be a further study. And then based on the results of that, uh, we present that to the State Historic Preservation Office. And in some cases, there's nothing we need to do. And in other cases, there are things that we do do. As a, for instance, in Tarrytown, which is a historic district, and we're taking down um, a building that's not in the historic district, but still connected to it, we've decided to put in essentially a historical um, photographs and uh, narrative about the history of the property uh, in the village. I think on a site like this, depending on what we find, what Mr. Hernandez suggested just to expand on that might be a great idea, which is we have a linear park. And if we were to have things along that linear park that go from Water Street up through the arch, you know, essentially with, I could imagine having bronze signs, you know, little plaques describing elements that were on the property before hopefully with the grinding wheel or whatever we find, I think that'd be great. It's a great way to sort of not only have the connection, but uh, the physical connection, but have the cultural connection so people see it when they walk through the site. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, next, we have um, Susie Ross. Okay, Susie. I am bringing you in. Please introduce yourself and uh, give us, for those who don't know, uh, your relationship to the village. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Thank you. Hi, Susie Ross. Um, I am chairperson of Green Ossining, and I um, have been, uh, I think, probably involved with watching this project um, from the beginning. And I'm pleased to see a lot of improvements from the last time that I uh, had a chance to look at what uh, was going to be, or the proposed development of this. So I have a few questions though, and, and most of my concerns at this moment are really related to the floodplain. Um, my concern has been and remains that Water Street will be underwater um, and that is the main, uh, the main uh, thoroughfare for people to connect with that building, whether it's, whether it's parking or walking into the building um, itself or using that, uh, the area, of, um, the, the space in, in between uh, the kill that, that you've developed for people to walk around. Um, it's also for the people potentially living there. And so my question relates to the sources of information that you're using. Um, I, I, I want to apologize, I didn't get on the call until 20 minutes in, and I might have missed that. But um, I think I heard somebody say that FEMA was being used, uh, FEMA flood maps. And um, so that's one, one point I wanted to find out about what your source was with that. And then the other one uh, was really whether or not the site uh, right now has been developed using uh, the DEC's uh, guideline elevations uh, for uh, community risk and resiliency. Um, and that those documents, I know that that new ones just came out in November. That uh, the obvious uh, the, the the real reason behind it was to update uh, the the uh, guideline elevations for buildings before more uh, and, and for more relevant uh, sea level rise estimates have now been taken into account. So two questions really, what the source is for um, what you're building on and um, 
actually, I'm going to make it three. What the sources for the flood maps that you're using uh, for the floodplains and whether or not the DEC new guidelines were taken into consideration. And I guess third would be, um, will people be able to use Water Street from your perspective for the next 80, 100 years without concern that that road will be underwater? Thank you, um, Ms. Ross. Um, we uh, deeply appreciate these concerns because there's something, as you, you well know, we, we think about a lot here in Austin and we are not um, at all um, unaware of the potential and uh, possibly very devastating consequences of sea level rise um, and flooding along the waterfront. So beyond just this building, we have a responsibility also to make sure that we're doing things that positively, positively impact the people who live there today, um, not necessarily in this development, but the people who live along Water Street. This is a populated area, um, and all of these things are a concern for people today as well, um, because of course they would be impacted as well. So it's something we've given a great deal of thought to. I think that since you missed the first part of the presentation where we covered a lot of the sources that we're using, I'm going to first turn this back to uh, Emmy Martinez to, to just recap that. And then we can talk about um, DEC and also how we plan for the um, for things uh, going forward that really require a myriad of, of uh, collective efforts, um, not just here in Austin, all along the Hudson River, um, with Metro North and other things as well. So with that, I'd like to start with uh, Jaime Martinez, and then I think we have other people on this call who can speak to the, the other issues, the very important issues you've raised. Uh, hi, Susie, how you doing? Great, thank you. See again, I'm gonna actually share my screen real quick um, to go back to the presentation. I think you missed the beginning of it. Um, a lot of this was done in response to some of the comments that we've gotten from you, to be quite honest. Um, so the, um, you know, part of the concern about this site that's been expressed by many in the community, including yourself, is that uh, it is important to understand that there are limitations to the FEMA maps. Um, and so when working with um, Wilder Balter, we, you know, we mentioned to them that they needed to be uh, taking into consideration things like the CAD adaptive design study and, and the underlying data that they use, which was the, um, the, the Columbia data, the season uh, data. So the, the, the presentation actually does refer to that specifically. Um, so you can see here, I mean, we do talk about it a little bit and we talk about the Cornell um, adaptive design studio. Uh, but the, the, the basis, I think, for some of their data was essentially looking at those projected FEMA maps as sort of a baseline, uh, then adding the 30 inches of sea level rise and looking at a 100-year floodplain um, and taking that data and sort of helping to guide that. Um, I want to say it with the caveat that this still has to go through planning board uh, process, so there's still going to be more discussion about this, but this is like the baseline um, that's looking at. And you can see here, this is the Hudson River Flood Impact Decision Support System that's built off of that same Columbia data. Um, and you can see the site is actually still, Water Street's not, you know, flooded in a 100 year flood plain at 30 inches. Um, so the level to which they're gonna be required to look at this depends on a lot of different things, including uh, state financing, insurancing, and everything else. And so I, I do need um, them to kind of jump in. But uh, in as much as I'm not an engineer, uh, we did ask for Rich Williams uh, from Insight Engineering, who is the site engineer for this uh, proposed development, to come and speak a little bit more about this. Um, so with that, I want to hand it over to Rich. Thanks, Jaime, and good morning, Susie. Good morning. Um, so to answer your question about how this ties to DEC's Community Risk and Resiliency Act, um, if you go to the DEC's webpage, they list in their, on, on the website a table of projected sea level rises. And to tie that 30 inch sea level rise that Jaime just suggested to DEC CRRA, um, basically for the New York City Lower Hudson uh, Valley, DEC projects a 30 inch sea level rise as on the high end of the spectrum for 2050s, just to relate it to a time interval. So we've projected this out quite a ways um, and now with that, we took a look at the sea level rise with the 100 year storm uh, 
occurring at the same time. And what you saw in that mapping that Jaime just put up was that Water Street actually acts as a dam almost where the Hudson River side is what actually floods and it extends up the Sing Sing Kill, but not out of the Sing Sing Kill. Um, so we did take that data into account. Um, we also took a look at not the effective FEMA maps, which are currently the standard maps, but what's coming down the pipe, the preliminary FEMA maps. And Maxwell and his team have adjusted all the building elevations to make sure that we keep the building above uh, the preliminary floodplain elevations um, so that we can you know, build this building for longevity. Did that answer your question? Um. It does, but I'm, I, okay, so I, so just to be clear, this building is being built with the projections to 2050, not past that. Um, it goes, and on the high side, so New York State has looked at a uh, low, medium, a low, a low, medium, a medium, a high, medium, and a high probability for sea level projections, and this is using the high end, um, of the 2050s, which equates to a medium level of the 2080s or greater than a low probability in the 2100. So it, it's, it's kind of a sliding scale. Yeah. Um, th well, then the other question I, that I'm not sure I understand is the reliance on FEMA data because FEMA data has I mean, it's, it's obvious, it's been criticized for undercounting, you know, substantial risk of flooding. Uh, more, more Americans have been placed in jeopardy in terms of their homes and businesses because of FEMA um, and their, their, uh, their, their floodplains. And it's not, that's why the Columbia data is, has been used um, much more because it takes into consideration coastal storms and rising rivers and flash flooding and all the other things that we'd really be very concerned about. So um, I'm not sure where the FEMA part of this comes in at all. Good, good the point. Uh -huh. It's the basis for the Columbia data, but it's not the only thing that's considered. So on its own, standing on its own, it's, it's, uh, it's something I'd be very concerned about using alone. Yeah. Understood, and we're not. Um, we looked at, we mentioned FEMA because we have to, because that's what the current flood ordinance recognizes. Um, but it wasn't the only source. We did look at the Columbia data. Um, and if you looked at the map Jaime just uh, put up, um, and maybe Jaime, if you won't, uh, don't mind sharing the screen again. What we do find as you look at this, uh, this image, um, and this is obviously the, the Columbia data with a 30 inch sea level rise and a hundred year storm on top of that. You can see that uh, once you cross Water Street, the flood bound stays within the Sing Sing Kill. Um, and we have taken a look at how that would impact our development. And we believe we've accommodated that in our building design. Um, we will also, as part of the planning board process that Jaime mentioned before, we are going to have to do a floodplain analysis study just to make sure that we're not impacting the floodplain um, and make sure that we understand the impacts on our building and model that and have accounted for it in our design. Okay. Yeah, I want to also kind of mention that, um, again, it's, it's still going through the process, but one of the um, elements of this project um, is that there's no residential on the bottom floor. Uh, so the only parts of the building that could theoretically be affected uh, are um, the retail and sort of commercial uses on the bottom. Uh, but I, I believe that there has been some elevation of the building itself from where the site is. So it's not it's not on the sort of the low end by the Water Street side. It's actually more uh, on level with the um, back end, which is, a, I believe, a couple of feet up. Uh, so those are elements that really get dealt with at the planning board. And again, you know, there's just the, the limitation of trying to do all the elements of, of this process here. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, your, your concerns are, are certainly being strongly um, held as part of this process and, and um, being integrated to make sure that the final, um, you know, the final project will be reflective uh, of those concerns. 
So, yeah, the only thing that I just at quickly, again, want to reframe if I have to is just that it's not just the flooding issue and what would be affected by it and with regard to the um, building itself, it's that people have to get in and out of that building. Mm -hmm. And so in 2100, are people going to be able to get in and out of that building? Because this is a huge investment for the community, even for the developers to make when people won't have security. I mean, nobody builds a building for 30 years. Um, that's crazy, especially with you know, what is promising to be a really wonderful addition to our waterfront. I just remain concerned that people who will be living there over time will not be able to get in and out of that building. And that's a, an, an injustice issue, in my opinion. So I, I, I think um, I love that there's this opportunity to you know, have Q&A. And I really do think that I've, I've seen a lot of improvement um, from the original. And it seems like you are definitely taking community feedback. And so I'm grateful for that. Um, I don't expect you to have all the answers, but I just, that question will remain in my head that until I think that people can live there safely, um, and 2100, I mean, they should always be able to live there safely, but that at least is, you know, 80 years from now, we're not building buildings for 80 years. We should be building them for much longer than that, but certainly not 30. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Susie. You. Um, we we Thank so appreciate um, the uh, real thoughtfulness that you put into this and, and the importance of long range planning as well as short range planning. I think the biggest challenge of our time is that we don't really know um, a lot of things about what are going to happen in the next 80 years. Um, and, and that is a concern that we all live with every single day. So in the efforts to do the best we can, um, those considerations are being taken into account. Um, however, the issue of the waterfront um, universally and any, any place that is near sea level rise across you know, each coast of the United States and every coast of every, every continent um, is, is a, an issue that we're going to have to be dealing with collectively. Um, there is no local solution on, on that level. So it is um, our hope that uh, we are also going to be working with um, the DEC, which will have uh, monies available for uh, flood prevention, uh, sea level rise prevention at some point. Um, it is um, going to be um, important to all communities that invest in their waterfront to be able to protect that. We also have a major transit line that goes through this. So it is our hope that as we go forward with what really is a, a very conservative approach to development of our waterfront compared to a lot of other waterfront communities, that we are increasingly sensitive about ways we can do, not only um, make the changes that we need to make to address the most critical issues we have now, but also look forward in ways that we can do things more regionally, more collectively and more impactfully. Um, because again, when it comes to sea level rise, uh, we can't work alone or, or in isolation on that issue. I don't know if any other, um, if, um, uh, Bill or anybody else from the Balter team has anything else to add to um, the, the balance and the, the ability to do due diligence that is um, long reaching and um, make sure that we mitigate these concerns to the best of our possibility, uh, best way possible. I mean, the only thing I would add is that I think uh, what Susie brings up, uh, which we heard sort of after we were selected um, by the village, uh, we heard a lot about this. We had spoken to Riverkeeper about, uh, excuse me, Santa Cutson and Riverkeeper actually, um, but particularly uh, Santa Cutson and looked at the mapping and the data that was available other than the FEMA maps. Um, uh, I'm sorry. The, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I thought someone was talking. Um, and I think we've adjusted our site as uh, has been discussed. I think that as an investor, in this development, as Susie points out, as the developer, um, we are also concerned about preserving um, our investment. Uh, while this is going to be an evolving process and we're going to go through the secret process and have a lot of outside agency 
uh, review of this, I think we also want to make sure that what we're building is a, for the long term. Um, my, you know, my greater concern is sort of on the other side of uh, to the west of our site, what happens with the Metro North tracks, access to train stations up and down the Hudson. Um, I think those are all valid questions. I think what happens to Water Street over time is a valid question, but I think we're going to do our part on our site and, you know, we have to, we believe that we don't want to be immobilized, all of us, and do nothing because we don't know what's going to happen in a hundred years, but I think we need to do the best we can to have projects that are sustainable. I appreciate that. I, I, um, I, I'm thinking about this just in a way that, you know, you're starting, uh, whereas everybody who lives down there and the train as well is inheriting. And so you have a chance to look at this um, from a zero base and that's to your benefit. So I, I feel that I, I appreciate you being open to hearing suggestions and uh, thanks for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Um, thank you, Susie. Um, next, I'd like to um, call over uh, Elizabeth Feldman. Okay, um, Elizabeth, Liz, I'm bringing you over. Uh, please introduce yourself and let us know your relationship to Austin for those who are unaware. Hi, okay, I'm Liz Feldman, Elizabeth, and uh, I'm a longtime lover of the Hudson River and also one of the town council people. Um, but my questions are more to do with from being a lover of the river. And I did want to uh, add to the comment that somebody had made that the storm impacts come from the Hudson up the kill. Um, you need to look back to Tropical Storm Floyd where the impacts came down the kill. And I know that Metro North had made some improvements to accommodate that, but we had even cars coming down the kill um, and some severe flooding. So you might want to look at that impact, those impacts, um, potential impacts as well when you're doing your planning. But my question, um, I know you're talking a lot about the stormwater coming down, but that's a freshwater tributary, um, which is really vital, eco-sensitive breeding ground for a lot of species of fish that, you know, even saltwater fish that like to lay their eggs in the freshwater. And I see that you're going to be um, disrupting the stream bed, especially um, of concern is during the brownfield cleanup. Will you be protecting it during the cleanup and will you be restoring it back to a natural state so that it does uh, leave a breeding ground and an area for the fish to continue to procreate? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Feldman. So, um, of course, we have, uh, we have deep concern for all living things in Austin. Um, but I do uh, want to toss this over to uh, our, our engineer again to talk about uh, improvements made since Floyd um, and other things that impact um, and address the, the issues that you're, you're bringing up, which are all very, very important to us and have been talked about internally. So. Thank you, Karen. Hi, Liz. So your first question was about the um, debris that came down the stream during Floyd. I actually started in Ossining, um less than a year after Floyd. And, and one of the things I worked on um, was some of the capital improvements necessary after that tropical storm. The Kilbrook itself through photo documentation and what I've discussed with folks along there, it sure did take a lot of material down there, including cars and, and, and the like. One of the main things we concerned ourselves with when we were constructing the Kilbrook Trail and the sanitary sewer rehabilitation was just that. Um, it included a lot of input from Gareth Hawkins' group um, for the estuary and aquatic life we did the best we could with the existing sanitary line, existing easements and existing contours in the stream to maintain the ability for upstream spawning from the Hudson that still exists. Um, I'm sure if Gareth was on this call or if you approached him and discussed it, he will tell you that although um, things are never perfect, the 
um, pollution in that stream has dropped orders of magnitude and the aquatic life has increased by the same. Um, we've done everything we could to maintain the, um, to limit any waterfall details in the Killbrook to allow for that spawning. And one of the things we mentioned in this presentation was the incorporation of a dissipation pond on this side of this, on the on this project's side of the Central Avenue Bridge to allow for a lot of that um, debris, that aforementioned debris that you that you referenced from Tropical Storm Floyd to get collected so it doesn't make its way and sediment doesn't make its way into the downstream culverts that would ultimately block the culverts um, and prevent future upstream spawning. There's two players in that maintenance. It's the village of Austin and Metro North. I'll speak for our culverts that go underneath Water Street and then come open stream again and then drop down underneath the village's parking lot. And then it goes to a third culvert before it gets to the open channel again, just north of the Harbor Square property. The village maintains the culvert underneath the train station parking lot and the culvert underneath Border Street. We do that routinely and you can see there's very limited debris in there. And because we're, we're cognizant of the, the um, impact of having limited flow through either of those culverts. Metro North is, um, is plagued by debris buildup underneath their tracks. Um, putting it crudely, they get it from both ends. They get when the stream flows in from the Hudson and when it flows down from our end. When we first put out the RFP, not this, not, not the RFP that um, Wilder Boulder uh, was selected for, but the RFP prior to that one about 10 years ago, um, I sat with the planner at the time and included what they are incorporating, what Wilder Boulder is incorporating into this project here, which is that energy dissipation and sediment collection basin on the eastern end of the property because we wanted to partner with Metro North because they were saying a lot of that debris is coming down from your site. We've done a lot, we've done a lot in our culverts and on our site to limit that. And this will really complete the picture of limiting any sediment that comes downstream to the, um, the Metro North culvert. They still have to deal with the sediment coming from the other end on the Hudson, but um, we are uh, very aware of all the things you mentioned. And um, I think that when this project is completed, it's gonna be as, as um, ecologically friendly as it possibly could be. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, Ms. Feldman, Liz, um, any yeah. other questions? Um, yeah, well, that answers what they've done to mitigate a storm such as Floyd. But what I'm asking is what topography on the bottom of the stream is going to be put back in place when they're done and will it promote the breeding? So uh, before, I'm gonna turn it over to Rich in a second, but before you do that, um, I, I forgot about that second part of the question where you talked about upsetting the stream. Um, when we did our project, um, because of the classification of the stream, which I'll let Rich talk about a little bit in a second, um, we were allowed to create um, flow bypasses and allowed to construct um, uh, temporary access roads. And it was all under uh, the DEC um, um, biological permit division. And I could, I could venture to say that the work that we did in the stream was um, uh, significantly greater than what I believe Wilder Boulder is going to do with regard to upsetting the existing stream bed. The majority of their work is going to be along the, uh, the sidewalls and along the side banks to create that path and to um, fortify the existing um, side walls and head walls and parapet walls where they exist. Um, the stream bed itself, I'm sure is something that is, again, gonna be um, 
upset to some extent, but not without uh, DEC oversight and significantly less than what we were permitted to do when we did the uh, sanitary sewer construction. But let's, you know, and we keep saying the sanitary sewer construction, keep in mind the sanitary line that runs through the Kilbrook um, diverts on Central Avenue and runs down to the county's main sanitary sewer interceptor at the intersection of Central Avenue and Water Street. The sanitary line that we encased in reinforced concrete uh, upon which the trail sits does not continue underneath the Central Avenue Bridge. Essentially, Wilder Boulder is constructing a path um, where there is no infrastructure. There's no public works improvement. This is strictly going to be a path. So the project and the interruption to the stream associated with this project is, is significantly less. And with that, I'll finally roll it over to Rich. Actually, wait, before you did, my, well, part of my question is I watched the Bramfield cleanup during Harbor Square, and I know that's an extensive project. Um, and, you know, will there be protections during all the digging and everything for the stream bed, um, you know, at least isolate it so that those toxins don't get into the stream or sediments because it's a big process. Um, and I understand that the sewer goes the other direction, which means this is one of the untouched areas. I mean, there's a lot of bypasses um, and disrupted areas. So this is one of the few areas that hasn't been disrupted in many years. Um, so that's why I'm asking about this particular area of the stream. Understood. Again, I think, Rich, do you have some, you, you can probably better answer the, um, the um, stormwater plans and the SWIP associated with the Brownfield Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan with the Brownfield cleanup and then the site itself. So our, our goal is going to be not to touch the stream as much as possible. Um, we want to leave things in their natural conditions, uh, particularly with respect to the stream bed. Um, and as Paul mentioned, we will be rebuilding the walls on the sides of the Sink Sink Hill. Um, we're going to do that without trying to go into the stream bed as much as possible. As far as during the brownfield, we will develop erosion control plans and soil management handling plans to isolate off the sink sink hill. Um, we haven't developed all the details of that, and we're obviously going to have to work with the village and community stakeholders in the development of that plan, and it'll all be presented to the public openly. Um, where we are going to be probably doing the most work in the sink sink hill is on the upstream end, and that is going to be in order to create the walkway. Uh, which will be similar in nature to what was done as part of the storm sewer project uh, that Paul's been mentioning. Um, and also on the shore of the Sting Sink Hill on the upstream end in order to create this stormwater improvement energy dissipation structure. But again, the, the main objective in all of that is to stay out of the natural stream path as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in a related question that we've gotten in, in our comments, um, Miguel Hernandez is asking, is there any dredging of the kill contemplated? So I think we've sort of addressed that. But Paul, do you want to sort of expand on that? Oh, again, um, I'm going to probably turn it to Bill, after a quick introduction, saying that um, I don't believe dredging and uh, is part of your um, brownfield cleanup. And again, with the limited interruptions that Rich mentioned for the construction of the public improvement path is in the specification either. Hi. So oddly, we're doing a development in Peekskill right now, which has a something called the McGregor Brook that runs right through it similar to the Sing Sing Kill and Osling. Really weirdly, it's also between Central Avenue and Main Street in Peekskill. That is also a brownfield site and we're just finishing the brownfield cleanup. Uh, it's a track one cleanup, which is the highest level of cleanup. I bring that up because it's very parallel to what we're gonna be doing here. The brownfield cleanup program that we expect to put the property into has tremendous oversight by the DEC on all things, including uh, the, in this case, uh, the Sing Sing Kill what we do to the Sing Sing Kill. I think one place here that uh, I just wanted to pause on 
the Sing Sing Kill uh, stream bed has a tremendous amount of uh, debris and um, uh, material in it from over the years of the flooding. I think that net net will significantly improve the Sing Sing Kill as a part of this project. The reason, for example, that we're, we are rebuilding the walls of the Sing Sing Kill is not an aesthetic reason. It's because the walls are failing and need to be rebuilt. When Maxwell had described what we're gonna to do to beautify them and raise them, we're doing it first and foremost because it needs to be done. As long as we're doing it, we're gonna make it a, uh, an asset to the development. But all this will happen in a way that um, has tremendous oversight, not just from the village, but also from the DEC and the brownfield cleanup itself, where we're gonna be removing material uh, will be away from the walls of the uh, Sing Sing Kill. We don't expect that we're going to be removing the walls of the Sing Sing Kill at all as a part of our cleanup. We'll just be rebuilding the walls as sort of putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. Thank you. Um, we also, I'm noticing that uh, Susie Ross uh, has her hand up. Susie, do you have another uh, question? Thanks, sorry. I just, uh, it just occurred to me just because I know you're going to be covering brownfields uh, next week. Um, uh, but has the cleanup remedy been determined uh, for the site uh, completely? Me, uh, Stuart? How would you um, like uh, Bill, why don't you start and, and we can have staff uh, also talk about some of the, the recent discussions um, that we've been having with the DEC. Sure. So briefly, we'll, we will ultimately submit um, a plan to the DEP once we're in the program, but we're not in the program currently because of the consent agreement that, the, uh, that Con Ed has with the DEC. They're still responsible. The level of plan that they want to do, we don't think is anywhere close to uh, appropriate. So our goal, as was done on Harbor Square, would be to enter into an agreement with Con Ed and the DEC where we will do the cleanup to a higher level. But I think Stuart probably can give you a better answer than that. You said most of it, Bill, but I, I will say, uh, Susie, we did get uh, recently from uh, the state published its fact sheet with regard to this location. Uh, comment letters are due back to the DEC, I believe on the 26th of February. Uh, I know that Wilder Bolter will be sending in a letter. I know that the village will be sending in a letter. Uh, the uh, alternative selected by Con Ed's representative, as Bill has correctly pointed out, uh, is insufficient. So we will be looking for a, uh, a more robust uh, uh, work product with regard to the uh, extent of the brownfield cleanup. That's great news. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Um, I also noticed that now uh, Elizabeth Feldman, Liz Feldman, do you have another question as well? I see your hand is up. You're on um, mute, yes. I, take, I just didn't take my hand down. Sorry about that. I'm good. Okay. Um, so I'm not seeing any additional questions. I do see there's a few more people um, on the list here. Um, so if you have any questions, comments, concerns, we would love to hear from you now. Um, you can also write to us, call us, and, and talk to us anytime. We are happy to answer additional questions. We have two more uh, 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 of our, our DPW, two more installments of our DPW engagement series. But again, if there's any questions right now, we are happy to take them. I think we're good. Not seeing any, I'd like to turn this back to our mayor and our trustees for any closing comments. Great. Um, love to hear from the trustees if they have some questions, but I have uh, something before we uh, close this session. Uh, a personal request. Um, I know those are just uh, renderings, um, folks, but those people in the renderings uh, don't reflect this community. Frankly, I don't think they reflect any community in downstate New York um, in, in the 21st century, and this is being built for the next 100 years. So if you could, in the future, either... Uh, use a more diverse rendering um, of people of color, um, 
seniors, which I believe that um, to your credit in the last uh, meeting, you discussed some handicap accessibility issues within the apartments, which was very impressive. Um, that's just a request that uh, we portray people, not leave uh, people off um, pictorially and visually. Uh, my question is, I didn't get a chance while we were on to look at leads. Is the gold leads standard the highest standard or is there one above gold? Is that anybody can answer? I just didn't get a chance to, or I couldn't find it on their website anyway. I will. There, there are a lot of different green building standards. Uh, LEED has many levels. Um, LEED Gold is what we're currently have committed to on this development in Peekskill and in Tarrytown. In our Peekskill community, as a for instance, which is a LEED Gold community, we're right on the edge of getting to what's called LEED Platinum. That's what um, I thought. Okay. So it's possible we'll get to that point in Peekskill. It's possible we'll get there in Tarrytown. It's possible we'll get there on this site, but it's not something that we can commit to until we're way further along. Okay. Because, you know, as the mayor of Austin, I want us to be number one on top. So, however, um, what the standards are, it was actually hard to follow um, their website. And um, I want to talk a little bit or ask questions, both as a mayor, but also as a resident, about the parking lot. We talked a lot about water, but the environment is much more than just the water. Although building with a body of water going through the middle of the development is, is no easy feat. So the parking lot seemed to me, um, and I'm not going to talk about aesthetics. It's not my aesthetics, but aesthetics are very personal but it seemed to me a lot of material. I was under the impression that today's and future parking lots are built with fewer um, distractions and walls for the security and safety of people who park their cars so that things are more visible. So that people aren't, um, as a friend of mine in Binghamton said, having lots of parties and parking lots because the police can't see them. Um, it, there seems to be a lot of material and material from an environmental point of view is generally a negative. So that's one question about the parking lot. The second question is, is their thought, I really love the green gardens since our last meeting, kudos, love it. But the parking, the top deck, whether it's an extra deck that is being thought about for the public use, will there be a um, solar um, canopy? I was with Sustainable Westchester a couple of days ago talking more and more about um, solar canopies above parking lots, which um, would help actually um, the tenants and they would actually help you as, as the management company uh, for the next 99 years. And there are recently been uh, community solar uh, initiatives here in Westchester just recently rolled out that have financial benefits both to tenants and to developers depending on how you participate. So those are my um, comment and two questions. So as far as the garage is concerned, I think that the idea of an open garage as opposed to a garage that looks more like a building is definitely on the table. It's a good, I think it's a good consideration. Um, the idea of a solar canopy on top of the uh, top level of the garage, I think that's probably going to be something that we talk with the village about as we move forward. We have anticipated that this in, in, the, in our response to the RFQ, that we would build this extra level of parking for municipal parking. If the village wants to have uh, a solar canopy above that, or if we want to have it and, and essentially have the right to put that above the village's level of parking, both very good ideas. We're already doing a large solar array in our building. Um, our goal on these developments is to get somewhere between a third and 50% of the electric use of the building, uh, total electric use of the building uh, through solar. So I, we're, as we move along, I think these are all good things you brought up and I think they're all things we'll look at. I, I really appreciate that, Bill. With each of these sessions, we're going to learn new things. So I appreciate it. Um, if I may open to um, the trustees um, for questions or comments, if we have any. I can go next. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so start with gratitude for um, all of the folks from uh, Jamie to Maxwell to uh, uh, Paul, all the way around uh, that helped put this together. Super informative. Um, I found that the section in particular with the renderings that um, I, you I explained, Maxwell, to be particularly illuminating for uh, really making it clear what it is that this project can be. 
Um, so I thought that that was great. So one specific thing in response to the mayor, this is actually one thing that I respectfully disagree with the mayor on where I, I had my eye toward what are the people, what are the representations of the people in the renderings? I did find it to be relatively diverse. They are looked to be multiracial families, older people, all sorts of things. And I wouldn't want to uh, kind of have a check the box, like is there every single kind of person in every single image? Because then it's a little bit cartoonish. I, I, I trust your professional judgment. And I also find uh, this particular thing interesting uh, because there are historically mostly young Scandinavian people in renderings of uh, architecture. And so uh, I'm sure you're familiar with non-Scandinavia and other kinds of uh, resources of uh, having people of color uh, in PNG form for rendering. So I would, I would continue the push. I think that the spirit of the mayor's comments uh, are spot on and, and I uh, endorse those um, and wouldn't want to, to push to cartoonish levels to feel like we've uh, hit everybody on the, on the list. Um, Number two, that's just a comment. Number two, uh, which is uh, a, a comment question, is one of the things that we spoke about earlier was around uh, researching the uh, Native Americans and, and this site. One thing that I would love is, I don't know how it might work, but um, when uh, I, I went to Vancouver many years ago, the Vancouver airport has all of these Native American pieces of art throughout the airport. And to me, it's like you arrive at the airport and it's immediately visible how a part uh, the uh, Native Canadians, the, the first peoples uh, there are really important to their culture. And I think similarly here, if there are any nods that we can make to first peoples in the architecture of uh, this building, whether it's on the inside or the outside, um, I think that that's really valuable. We've discussed having photos of what the site used to look like on the lobby or something like that. I think that's cool. We should definitely do that. But any nods that we can have toward uh, the Native peoples, I think would be great. The last piece, because neither one of those has anything to do with greening our waterway, which is the purpose of this meeting, um, is that I think that having the kind of considerations that you have, this is in response to uh, Susie's question, um, I, into uh, building this, I, really, really uh, important in any way that as we are talking about this in the future. So after all of this is done, um, talk, I, 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 I would want to reinforce the long-term nature, the long-term impact that a project like this can have on the uh, on the environment, certainly, but then it, just in the community more widely. So I think the point uh, that I took, one of the points that I took from what Susie said is let's have a long-term vision and impact for this site as well. And, and so I want to underscore uh, that as we continue to talk about this. But uh, thank you so much for uh, all of this. Really exciting. I plan, once this is on YouTube, to take that section out where we're talking, where Maxwell, you talk about the renderings and sharing it with everyone in the world so that they can see this is exactly what we're trying to accomplish here. So thank you. Ma'am, may I add one thing to that? please, or respond to that. Um, when I was talking before in response to Susie's question, um, one of the things I didn't say that it's important, we really believe that everything we do needs to be an example of what can be done. And we want to do better than just sort of checking a box on anything. We want everything we do to be something that people go back and look at that and use as an example of what can be done. And I think that what uh, Omar just said is really brings that up I think there's so many ways to do that here. I think, you know, from we're doing a building that arguably will be one of the coolest buildings done in this part of the county, and it's a mixed income building. That's so cool. It's a brownfield site that is three and a half acres that is currently blocked off from the public, and it's not a connection. We're going to make it a connection. We're going to make it a linear park, and it's not going to just be for our residents. It's going to be open to the public, more than open to the public. It's going to be designed, it's being designed in a way to encourage the public. I think these and many other things, the green construction, it's, we really want to show people what can be done. So I, I'm more than just what Susie said about the sea level rise. I think in everything we do, um, I think it's incredibly important to all of us to do that. I know this is a village's property and they sort of have to decide if they really want to do this or not. But as someone who's been doing this for 30 years, we take it, I promise you, just as seriously as the village does and, and the public. It's a great opportunity and we should all use it. Thank you, Bill. Madam Mayor, I'm done. So if you want to hand it off to someone else. Yeah, I'm waiting actually. I'll say something. Yeah. Um, well, the more I learn and the more I see about this project, the more I warm up to it. 
Um, I think the renderings are terrific and really give us a visual of uh, what it could look like. Um, I think that the developer, Wilder Balter, top flight, thoughtful. I think these sessions are incredibly informative and well done. And I appreciate everybody who's called in and listened. Um, as we know, we cannot make this solely for residents of Austin. It's against the law. But I really do believe that our residents will benefit from this place. Um, one thing I want to, that I've always um, wanted to emphasize is having some sort of access up from maybe some area behind, within the property by, by the steep part of Main Street that accesses Main Street from the development. So that if you want to walk up Main Street, you don't have to go around and all the way up that that hill, which actually used to be called High Street in the 19th century and was the only way down to the waterfront. Incredibly steep, so steep that the oxen had to give time to rest on their way up when the farmers were returning from taking their crops to the river. So this is a historic place in that it was an extremely functional place historically. I would like, I think though that for a lot of people that that hill, I mean, even the oxen had to rest. Okay, so um, that hill is a challenge to me. I mean, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. Um, and it would be great if there were, if it, whether it's an elevator or a stairway or something that allows people to get up to our central business district there, just makes it a little bit easier for them. Um, I know an elevator, you know, stairs, you know, an elevator, I, 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 I think something had been discussed, but I, I haven't, I just want to make sure that remains a priority. Um, but uh, I, I think this is, I just get more excited about this every time we have another one of these sessions. And uh, um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Appreciate it. Uh, echo your words. Um, it's beginning to really take shape. Uh, I think it's it's fabulous. Manny is uh, Manny anything or uh, not? Yes. Uh, so I'm. You know, it's funny because before Dana said anything about the connection, just keep in mind that actually that was one of my questions in here, and I didn't want to forget because that was part of the RFQ process. The connection between this lot and Main Street portion of it, and everything that we have talked uh, so far. There has not been the connection. We, we talked about the connection on Central Ave, but not the, the connection between that and Main Street. We talked about how, how that will improve, well, at least the developer has talked about how will that improve to the Main Street portion, but not really show the connection. So that is not clear for me. So hopefully that will become clear. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Maxwell in regards to the renderings because that does bring a different perspective of how that may look. Again, uh, it's funny because I, I, you know, when you look at renderings, um, Maxwell probably knows this, it seems this before in the architectural field, you have the renderings and reality. So sometimes the renderings and reality, it doesn't look like, you know, the, the, the beautiful renderings that sometimes we get. So I do, I, I want to ask two general questions, sure. And, and you, you know, we can talk about this another time or internally, however it is. Um, when I was involved in one of the previous projects, um, I came in after the whole thing was done. We just needed to do special permit approvals. And I was told that um, at that time, we could not talk about materials in that building, just because that wasn't our preview. Because again, everything was done by the time we got, by the time I became a trustee. This is a little bit different. Uh, we are in the process of that. So at some point of time, I would like to talk about materials and what that looks like uh, before you even go to the, to the planning board, because I know the planning board and architectural view board will look at that as well and what that looks like and what that means. But because this is a village on property, I would like to take advantage of that um, before they even go there. So but I, I don't want to have an answer to that right now. We can discuss this another time. The other point is um, uh, not to piggyback in what Omar said and what Susie said, but more in general, sure, um, 
from a perspective of an engineer perspective and a perspective of an architectural perspective. Sure, when someone designs something, usually, you know, and Bill kind of touched a little bit about, about this, is like we don't design for 30 years, 50 years. We design it pretty much to stand there for a very long time, whatever the very long time is. Uh, you know, I remember when, when I went to school and we, we, we studied like, you know, how the water plants, you know, how New York City became all these other infrastructures, how we bring the water over. The, the, the thought up at that point was you design for 100 years, at least 100 years. So to me, you know, when we talk about the signing of, of something, whatever that is, the expectation is that it's going to be there for a long time. And what does that look like? We don't know yet. And it has to stand for a very long time. We've seen buildings. I've I seen buildings that are still standing on the waterfront of Yonkers and they're being repurposed for something else. So that's the expectation. I'm not talking about just, again, this is just an overall picture. I'm not talking about anything specific for this, for this project, but that should be the expectation of that. My last comment for Bill. So you mentioned that this is a very unique site and you want it to be the best. So are you saying that you want this site to be better than the one in Peace Guild that you're working on? I just want to have that for the record. <laughs> That's funny. No, I think it's, I think everything we do, I go back to Stone Creek next to Club Fit and Briarcliff, you know, which we built 30 years ago or so. And for what it is, it's a model of what could be done 30 years ago in affordable housing. You know, this is the Peaks of Development special for many reasons. This one's going to be special for a lot of reasons. One of the things in this development is uh, this is not being designed as a wood building. It's being designed as a, uh, Maxwell could probably, uh, do a better job of explaining this, but this is going to be a, uh, a light gauge metal steel like building uh, and, and reinforced concrete. It's gonna certainly stand the test of time. Um, architecturally, it's gonna be a beautiful building. I'm really excited about it. Um, you know, we're building 27 story tower in New Rochelle. I'm excited about that too. I'm not gonna say, uh, I'm not excited about everything we do. This is why we do what we do. So yeah, we're excited. So is it gonna be better than Peace Kill? It'll be, you, you could just say pass, you know, <laughs> you don't have to actually answer. <laughs> okay, I'll so, pass. <laughs> uh, on that note, oh, it's always good thank to you. have this. Um, just a general reminder. First of all, um, thank you to everyone for being here on a Saturday, um, especially staff. It's not like they took the day off yesterday. Um, this is just ongoing. We have a number of initiatives. It's really impressive the amount of uh, patience along with expertise that is being brought on so that everybody feels that um, they're part of it. Um, I encourage you to tell your friends. I encourage you to share this on social. It's all on our website. Public engagement. So these are a series uh, of public engagement based on topic. Um, they're cumulative. They can be seen alone. But here's the other part, and Jaime mentioned it. Um, it will be coming in front of CK Schlott Salon from our um, EAC, that's a public meeting as well. And they do um, look to the public if it has uh, issues, questions, to send them in, to listen in. Planning board is also um, a public session, uh, bot at villageofossening.org. Uh, if you are um, a person who would rather speak to your representatives and are not um, so interested in having everybody um, see your questions. You might have something that may be controversial that you feel you don't want to say here. We welcome all of those comments. We will answer all of those comments. So there's lots of places for the public um, singularly in a group um, to be involved. I offered this last time. I know there's a lot of snow. I'm happy to take people on personal, you know, mayor tour of um, the site. I've done it for a few people who took me up on it. I'll drive down, wear your masks, and we can look at the site because looking at the site actually gives you a real vision of it, what's across the street, etc. My pleasure. Um, if any concerns constituents want to um, to go down there. This has been um, super enlightening. Uh, thank you all. I think we, I don't, I didn't bring my gavel. So I'm just going to say thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. Um, for those of you that are lucky enough to have Monday off, enjoy the downtime. Looking at Karen to see if there's anything else. I'm not seeing anything one, else. One more thing. One more oh, there thing. is one more thing. So okay. We got a comment from Susie Ross and it's oh, not a question, but I will read it because it is important. Uh, what Manny said, low carb carbon concrete, please, I need ambassadors. So again, building materials, I think, will be uh, important to us. Just conveying that to the developer, I think he already knows that. But um, 
the uh, I just want to and make sure EAC, all, all, all words are heard. Yes, and the EAC actually, this particular group for the past, I would say, two years, um, some of them actually are experts in some of this stuff and they volunteer to be on the AC. So I know Kate's taking this back to the group. They are all about materials. They have put up recommendations as people go. So I know they're going to hear, um, they're going to hear that comment as well. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the weekend and enjoy the oncoming snow for those of you that like snow. Thank you all. Bye. Take Bye -bye. care everybody. Bye-bye.